you are in Toronto, right? Yes. Okay, great. You know, this is this series is dedicated to horror film directors. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, well, thanks today. for having me. You were born in 1980 in Toronto, where you are right now. What are your first memories related to cinema? That's a good question. Apparently, the first movie I ever went to was Airplane. I was taken to Airplane as a child, but I can't remember it. Probably my cousin showing me the Star Wars films. I, I think that was embarrassingly straightforward. But when I was very young, my cousin was a Star Wars fan and showed me those films. Have you ever watched Airplane after that first I have. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I did like it. Maybe I had some sort of deep childhood nostalgia for it that I was only unconsciously aware of. Oh, I like Airplane, so it's, it's a good film. I watched it later, but it's a fun one. Do you remember the first time you were scared in the movies? Like, which was your first horror film that you've seen? Can you remember that? I think the first one... I mean, it's it's not exactly a horror film, but the uh, the thriller music video. I remember being very young in the '80s, and I'm not sure why I was watching it, but the the tr that transformation sequence. I remember being frightening for me when I was a kid. It's one of the most iconic music videos ever, right? It's great. And by the way, we contact John Landis for the series. So he directed Thriller, as you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be awesome. I know you were in a band before you started working in, in movies. And also you were very interested in writing before you decided to migrate to movies. What can you tell us about that? Like what attracted you in the film media for you to make this decision to become a director? Part of it was that I was extremely scattered. I mean, I was interested in, in music. I, was not in, I wasn't in a successful band or anything. I wasn't in a band you'd ever want to actually listen to, but I, I was playing music for quite a few years and, uh, and I really grew up reading a lot and loving uh, novels and, and wanting to write. Uh, I was also doing visual art. At a certain point, I kind of realized, you know, any, any of those things you could dedicate your entire life to and, and still not be great at, but to try to do all of that, you know, there was no way I was going to really get anywhere with them. So film, you know, it's, it's a great art form in and of itself, but it also allows you to engage in those elements and, and engage in music and visual art and, and writing uh, while focusing on, on one particular medium. And so that was one draw for me, certainly. But you never compose music for your films, have you? Because that could be a, a total, like, like, for instance, let's say John Carpenter. I mean, I was never that good, you know. I, mean, <laughs> I, I wasn't much of a composer. I played bass guitar. Not that you can't compose when you play bass guitar, but I, I was really more just a guy who played in bands. Do you believe cinema is the most complete art form? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, 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 I'm not sure what that means, ultimately. I mean, it's a fantastic art form in that uh, you know, it, it does engage so many of your senses. And, and I feel there's an aspect to film that kind of mirrors how our brains work. You know, you sort of take these sensory impulses, different shots, different scenes, and you, you line them up in a linear way. And then our brain kind of stitches them together in, into a narrative, you know, and obviously some of that is something we've learned through, through film language, but it's still endlessly entertaining for me. I really like cheating in films, you know, like to create a fictional space out of multiple real spaces is somehow really satisfying for me. It's just because I feel like it's engaging with that part of the brain that sees certain things and then tries to, to make a coherent experience out of them. In 2008, you directed your first short film, Broken Tulips, which, by the way, it's the only one I haven't seen it from your films. But it's about people that pay to be injected with viruses from celebrities. So it's kind of like a similar concept from your first feature, which is antiviral. How did that idea come from? Were you interested in making more like a critique towards the celebrity craze? Or were you interested in virus? Like what, what, which came first? Early on in film school, I, I got very sick. And so I, I had this really bad flu and I started obsessing during the illness about the, the kind of physicality of my, of my illness. The, the fact that I had these things in my body uh, that had come from someone else's body and, and were bred in someone else's body and were penetrating my cells and living in a sense in, in my bloodstream. So there was, 
in my mind, a kind of intimacy there. There's this intimate connection of having someone else penetrate you with their biological material and, and have that take root in you and cause this experience. So I wanted to make a film about someone who might see that as interesting. And I thought, okay, a celebrity obsessed fan might want, you know, Angelina Jolie's cold virus or, or something like that. The idea of that intimate connection, maybe they could see it. So I started writing that as a feature film initially at film school. But at the end of your four year program, the final year, you do a kind of thesis film, at least at the school I went to. So you spend the entire year doing one kind of elaborate short film. And I adapted the, the feature script into a short film as a kind of, you know, a dry run, which I could then use to kind of sell the feature idea. It's really essentially the opening of antiviral with a slightly different end. I'm curious to see it. If you have the link, I would be happy to, to watch it after. Um, it's, it's definitely a, a, a pretty low budget student film. You know, it's not, it's, it's pretty rough, but uh, yeah, gotta start okay. somewhere. It's interesting because usually, I mean, I'm generalizing, but usually the filmmakers would make a, a short film and then go to the feature. But it's interesting that you had to adapt your feature to a, to a short. That's an interesting twist, I would say. It, it turned out to be pretty useful. I mean, if you can tie a short film, I think when you're starting out to a feature that you want to do in any way, that's useful, but not like a trailer, you know, not like, not just a clip from it, but actually turn it into its own thing because then it can, you know, play Broken Tulips played some student festivals and it, it sort of had a, a little bit of a life of its own as far as a student film can have. And that, you know, you kind of have to prove to people somehow that you can do it before you, you can do it. When you actually did the first film then, which was in 2012, Antiviral, you mentioned the genesis of the idea about this thing. It's interesting what you said about the intimacy that you get with somebody getting a virus. Could you ever, of course, that's kind of like a silly question, but could you ever envision that we'll be talking about this film now in the middle of a pandemic, right? That you can get virus from everybody. And of course, it's a very scary reality nowadays because of the pandemic. I mean, could you ever imagine the film would be so tiny <laughs> I, I certainly didn't imagine that I would live through a pandemic. I mean, I guess there was SARS before. I mean, these sort of like less destructive pandemics. A lot of people were warning about the pandemic. So, you know, logically, yes, but you don't, you don't imagine the world is going to be shut down this way. Obviously, it's come up a lot during press for my current film, you know, because I made a virus film and because of, I'm working in genre, you know, is it great material for another film? Is this pandemic the root of some great idea? I'm not sure. I'm not sure it is, though, because the thing is in horror films, you know, if you have a virus, the virus usually stands in for something. It's usually figurative and it's usually, you know, a way to talk about other things. But during the pandemic now, I feel like the virus is too literal. You know, it's like we're all having this like very immediate, uh, you know, like a polyamorous relationship with the same virus. It's like a day to day thing, you know. And so how do you make a film about a virus where the virus stands in for something? You know, it's too literal. It's like trying to make a film about breakfast where breakfast is a metaphor. It's like you can do it, but it, it's, it doesn't have that kind of intrigue that it would otherwise. It's sort of the worst time to do a virus movie. It's interesting because in the beginning, I mentioned that this is a series of interviews. So I interview also one Brazilian director, a woman Brazilian director called Gabriela Amaral. And I asked her also the same thing about the virus. She didn't do any film about the virus per se, but how the pandemic will affect the filmmakers, the creative community from now on. You know what I mean? Like, because like you said, you cannot be literal and we are already living in a horror film, sort of, so... It's strange to see how creative people are going to come up with other scarier ideas than reality itself. It's interesting because I think we're learning a lot about ourselves, you know, through isolation and, and the ways that we're succeeding and failing at working together as a global community in terms of individual communities. It's been very enlightening, but how do you take that and do something interesting with it? I don't know if just making a pandemic movie is really the answer. Well, your film Antiviral premiere in Cannes, so in 2012 at Uncertain Regard. I think it's very interesting because I saw the film twice already to prepare for the interview. I had seen it before. And Antiviral has these both things, uh, meaning the virus itself and the celebrity. I don't know, would you say it's a satire on celebrities? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
What I was going to say is, for me, it was kind of ironic to have the film premiere in Cannes, where, as you've been there, of course, and I've covered the festival a few times, and Cannes is all about the crazy of celebrities, right? So it's interesting to bring the film to an environment that is so connected to the celebrity craze, and it's an irony about that. How was that experience for you, to show the film there? Yeah, it was very strange, and a few people asked me about that, I remember, on the press tour. Uh, some of them more kindly, some of them, <laughs> you know, at, at Cannes, they, they want to sort of stab you slightly. I think somebody asked whether it was hypocritical to show it at Cannes, you know, would I, if I was really making a statement, should I just not show it at, you know, anywhere or something like that? And, you know, I mean, partly it's the reality of, of filmmaking. I, I mean, you don't really have control over that, but if you have the option to show it at, at Cannes, I, you generally do that. But also, in a way, it's the most appropriate thing. Where else would be a better place to talk about celebrity and to have those discussions? And I think to experience that environment and then to premiere a film like that was very interesting because it is so immediate and tangible and completely crazed. It, it was hugely satisfying in that way. I think it was way more interesting than it would have been otherwise. I promise I won't stab you with a <laughs> super question. No, but I understand because, I understand like I said, I've been there, uh, I've covered the festival a few times, and I've seen really rouchy screenings. Let's say I can remember the Brown Bunny screening of mm -hmm. Vincent Gallo's films, which was one super scandal anyway. So I know Ken can be really tough, I guess. People are seeing five films a day and they're lined up for like three hours. And they're, you know, <laughs> if it's not exactly what they want, they're already mad at you. Like, <laughs> but it's, it's also great that way. I mean, I prefer strong reactions. I prefer someone to be mad at me. And I like the grumpiness is sort of part of the experience. I wonder how this year is going to be the festival. I mean, all the genres are super stressed. And this year, of course, everybody's going to be even more stressed. So it'll be an interesting experience. In Antifaro, you work with some really good actors, especially Caleb Laundry Jones and Malcolm McDowell. How was the work with these actors? And specifically in the case of Malcolm McDowell, did you have in mind his cinematic persona from Clockwork Orange? Was that any in your mind when you cast him? It's a funny thing. With independent films, there's usually this sort of like... I guess, push to have a kind of cameo role, you know, because you can't afford, <laughs> you know, someone like Malcolm McDowell for the whole film and you don't expect someone like that to be interested in, you know, a leading role. You're just sort of starting out, but there's this desire to kind of, on the production end, to, to get someone in to kind of draw attention to the film or something like that. So that role was sort of designed in the hope that we would get some great actor who was, you know, uh, better than we deserved in, in a sense. or. <laughs> you know, bigger bigger than we would have been able to get otherwise as a cameo. It wasn't specifically Clockwork Orange. I just think he's obviously a great actor and I love his work. So we were very lucky, very lucky to have him. You know, it was, it was for a couple of days. It wasn't like he was there for the whole shoot, but he was wonderful to work with and incredibly gracious and it was good. And what about with Caleb Landry Jones? He had done some work before, but I think it's a film that kind of put him more on the map, right? If you can say that. Yeah, I mean, he, he was in one of the X-Men films as a, a sort of smaller role, but he was, he was up and coming. I would hope that it was helpful for him uh, to be in that film. Certainly, I love Caleb. We've been in touch for years afterwards, and, and I'd still love to work with him more. I think he's really a particularly fantastic actor. So he was sort of starting his career, and again, we were, we were lucky to, to have him, but he was pretty fantastic to work with someone like that. Still talking about the film, why do you think people get so much obsessed with celebrities? Where do you think that comes from, the crazy about celebrities? I mean, I think it's an old impulse that we have to deify people. I don't think it's something new. I mean, even if you look at, say, you know, the saints and, and this, uh, the idea that people are elevated to the status of gods almost, and, but it's, it's through repetition of image, uh, you know, the images of the saints. There is that physical, almost fetishism, you know, churches that claim to have the finger bone of a particular saint, and therefore that bone is imbued with power and, and the, the church is imbued with power. Same with, you know, with royalty and people. You know, the, the Spanish accent being changed through mimicking royalty. I mean, there's such a history. I'm not entirely sure why we do it, but it is something that we've been doing for a very long time. I think it's a process that's hugely accelerated now and much more so since I made antiviral but as social media has continued to develop. The, the degree to which people become famous and the speed at which they become famous has certainly increased and the incredible influence they have over so many people. I'm not sure why we do it, but it, it does have to do with, I think, 
exposure to an image repetition, you know, but at the same time, distance, you see someone on billboards over and over again, you see them in movies again and again, you start to have this kind of weird relationship with them where it feels personal, you feel like you know them, but you don't actually, you have this sort of distance, it's not the same as relating to somebody who you actually know, and something in that tension creates celebrity. I don't know, I don't really know. One of the weirdest things from Antiviral that I'm sure a lot of people probably can ask you about that is are the celebrities' stakes. I don't, it's not a stake, but the, the cell product in the film they made of the celebrities. If you had to try one, whose celebrity would you eat? Uh, you know, yours, like, yours, yours probably. Uh. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> oh, scary, okay. If you'd be so kind. <laughs> Yeah, okay, no, what was it? <laughs> okay, well, uh, I'm trying to make questions that you haven't heard uh, 100 times, okay? So, uh, no, 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 it's, it's fine. <laughs> I mean, this, the celebrity thing thing's interesting too. A couple of years after, that was sort of a fake website claiming to be growing celebrity stakes. And it blew up. It was this massive, I don't think it was real. It didn't go anywhere, but it became this massive phenomenon. And, uh, I was a little upset that that wasn't our viral marketing campaign because <laughs> it, it really, it really kind of lit up the internet. But I would for sure, I would absolutely eat human steaks. I'm looking forward to cell steaks. I hear at the end of the year, there will be lab grown chicken meat for, for sale in Canada. I know in Singapore, I think they have a lab grown burger. So this is a little irrelevant, but I actually, I, I'm actually really interested in the real technology that that idea was based on. It's, it's actually starting to come to the consumer market. And uh, there's some art pieces that have already been growing human cells as a kind of statement. So it, it's sort of becoming a reality. I'm, I'm pretty curious about it. That's strange. Like, I don't know if I would be willing to eat like a fake chicken. Anyways, it will be probably more ecological, I guess. I think so. Yeah, I think there'll be a tipping point where it's just cheaper and less destructive. And, you know, eventually we'll have a generation that's comfortable with that because it'll start with, you know, McDonald's or something. We'll start adding like 20%, you know, lab grown beef or something, and then it'll take over from there. Now that you mentioned that, do you think it's weird when some crazy ideas, let's say, that you had for this film becomes reality? Isn't that strange? I don't know. Like maybe people will actually inject themselves with celebrities virus. I don't know. Maybe. It's possible. Usually the stuff I'm doing isn't meant to be predictive science fiction. It's, it's more meant to be satirical. And so, you know, again, the virus stands for something else in, in that film. It's, it's usually, uh, and with by the technology and possessor, it's not, for me, the point isn't really predicting the future. It's, it's to talk about what's going on now. But I think the reason so often that you see elements of science fiction becoming reality is that when you're writing this stuff, you're, you're looking at, you know, the early stages of developing technology that maybe aren't uh, things that have reached the kind of general consciousness yet because they're just beginning. And then you, you start to riff on, on those things. And, and it's just often the case, the lab meat that you were reading about you know, a decade and a half ago is something that was just starting. Eventually we'll get there, you know, eventually reality catches up. You mentioned that the virus was supposed to mean something else. So what did it mean to you? I mean, it's, you know, a metaphor for celebrity obsession as a disease, I guess. It's the easy, <laughs> the easy <laughs> metaphor. In 2019, you directed your second short film, Please Speak Continuously and Describe Your Experiences as They Come to You. Pretty long a title for a short film, I would say. Well, it was a very short film, so we needed to, <laughs> we needed to uh, get people's attention somehow. So uh, an obnoxiously long title seemed like the way to stand out. Well, uh, the film also premiered in Cannes in the Critics Week. And again, it's a film that very much mirrors the same theme of your next feature, which is Possessor. When you did the short film, did it happen the same way? Let's say you had the feature, the Possessor screenplay ready already, and then you did the short, or how was that process? It was actually a very, very weird process with that one because the first dream that's described in the short film was an actual dream I had about the people coming into the room and one small thing about them has changed. So I wanted to make that 
something. I, I like that idea. It's one of the few dreams. You know, usually you have a dream, and when you're dreaming it, you think this is a great idea because uh, I'm going to write this down. This is fantastic, and then you wake up and you realize it was complete nonsense. That it, it's totally useless. That that's 99% of the times that you think a dream is worth something. But that one actually still seems sort of interesting. So I wanted to do something with it. Weirdly, the short started as a beer commercial, um, in a sense, because there was this Vice thing. The Vice was doing something with Grolsch, where they were getting directors to make very, very short films that would sort of relate to, in a tenuous way, to like the values of Grolsch or something like that. I don't know. So I wrote that thing. They said, look, you can do anything you want. We'll give you this money for it. So I thought, okay, great. And so I wrote that thing. And then they said, actually, you can't do anything you want. <laughs> we, don't really, we don't really want it to be this. So I said, fine. And then I sat on it for a few years until at one point Possessor got pushed. It, it was we had a really hard time making it quite, quite often. It would seem to come together and then the financing would fall through or there'd be some sort of delay. And, and for a number of years, it kept almost happening and then, and then falling apart. So we'd been doing all these tests for Possessor and we were ready to go. We were really eager to make the feature and it fell apart. And then just with my team, we just were so eager to make something and also to use some of those visual ideas that we were planning for the feature in the context of an actual film that we just decided we would do the short and that's where I sort of dug up this you know abandoned beer commercial and, and flushed it out a little bit. One thing that I really like about the short film and that you did also in the feature is that you try to use physical effects rather than CGI, right? Could you talk about that? Like, why do you prefer physical effects rather than CGI? There are times when CGI is the right approach. You know, I, I don't hate computer effects. I don't hate VFX. And there were some in, in, in Possessor. I mean, we, we did work with a VFX company that was mostly doing a bit of cleanup here and there and, and some set enhancements. There's a sort of virtual, like a VR office that they made also. So it's not totally devoid of, of VFX. The vast majority of the effects are practical or mostly practical. There are two things. I, I think, first of all, there's a kind of texture and a weight to practical effects that I find really satisfying. I think if you can, at the very least, do most of it in camera as a practical effect. If you can really build things, you know, actual prosthetics, actual blood, it's going to feel different. And a lot of people, I think, in Possessor reacted to the, the violence in a fairly extreme way. I suspect part of it is because people are getting so used to completely digital violence, digital blood, that when you see these sort of old school practical effects, they carry a certain, a certain weight. The other thing is that the process is very interesting to me. It's a, there's a process to these kinds of practical effects. For instance, my cinematographer, Kareem Hussein, and I will do endless tests before we make a movie, especially on Possessor. We were, you know, because it kept pushing, we kept testing and, and testing and testing. There's something about getting your hands on the actual materials because it leads to these happy accidents. You know, you set out to test one thing, you have gels, you have some sort of liquids and, and lighting and stuff, and, and you're trying to create a particular type of image. And then you stumble onto something interesting by accident, and then you start exploring that, and that takes you down a path um, that starts to become central to the imagery of the film. And so with digital effect, at least for me, because I'm not a VFX artist, I can't do that. I'm not stumbling on uh, accidents if I do VFX. I'm sort of handing it over, saying this is what I want, and, and getting essentially that back. There isn't that process of exploration, which I really like. All right. Interface is active and we're at full power. This might be a bit of a rough jump. Just do it. As you wish. I really like the prosthetic masks from Possessor. You create some really cool scenes with the prosthetic, especially when they're kind of like melting. Those were really cool. I'm sure it must have been fun to do those. The actual melting was a very slow process. Dan Martin, our head effects artist who, who designed those, he makes these incredible fake heads. The Sean Bean head was incredible. And all this, the scalps and, and everything. I mean, we were able to do a lot more practically just because of how good he is at his job. Those melting heads took a really, really long time in practice. The, the last day of shooting was just 
everyone sitting essentially in, in this big open room while we very, very slowly melted these wax heads. I think half of the crew was watching basketball because the Toronto Raptors uh, <laughs> were, were, were in the finals and half of the crew was watching wax very slowly melt so you could kind of you know, see who the real geeks were. I'm sure you were the ones looking at the melting heads, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we jumped to Possess already, but I would like to take a step back and ask you about the origin of the film, because I was reading some of your interviews and I read something that for me was very interesting, that the idea kind of, now you mentioned the dream, but also that you had the idea of getting into somebody else's uh, brain while you were doing the promotion for your first film for Antiviral. Could you talk a little bit about that? That is where Possessor came from, really. I mean, the dream was the short, and it was its kind of own thing. Possessor, I started writing it back in 2012 on the press tour for Antiviral. And the thing is, when you're doing press for a film and you're traveling with the film for the first time, it's a very strange experience because you're either consciously or unconsciously constructing this public persona. You know, you're, you're doing these interviews and, you're, and Q and A's, but you're sort of performing this version of yourself, this kind of media self that then goes off and has its own weird life without you. And it's, it's like, you see yourself online and you think, who is this? I can't recognize myself in, in this person. It's this, this other character that you kind of construct. Um, and so I wanted to make a film initially about someone who may or may not be an imposter, in their own life as a way to talk about how we build characters and, and narratives just to operate as human beings. Because I think that it's, it's an especially weird version of it when you're on a press tour, but I think we all do that just to, just to function. We're always performing characters for other people. We're performing characters for ourselves as well. I don't think there's a kind of uh, true self that we have access to. It's not a question of real self and performed self. It's kind of all performance. And that was something I, I wanted to explore in a film. The sci-fi horror stuff kind of came later. It was actually the, the family scenes and, and the, the relationship scenes that were the, the genesis. Hi, darling. Hi, darling. Hi, darling. What, what have you got there? What have you got? Hi, darling. What have you got there? I like very much the cast you had from the film. Andrea Riseborough, we, we mentioned already Sean Bean and Christopher Abbott, and of course Jennifer Jason Lee, which I personally love her. But it was strange because specifically in the case of Andrea Riseborough and also Christopher Abbott, they were double acting. I don't know, because when Andrea Riseborough gets into the heads of the, the people that she gets in, she's acting as themselves, you know what I mean? So how did you create these layers of, let's say, double acting? Going into it, I thought it was going to be a difficult process. And there's a bit of a rabbit hole we could go down initially in terms of trying to figure out a formal process. I was asking them, you know, do you want to be on set for each other's scenes? Should one of you sort of take the lead and the other one follow? Or, or how do you want to do that? In practice, it was much more organic. I mean, they're both incredibly good actors and very collaborative. And so they, they made me look really good. And <laughs> they made my job very easy because it was just such an organic process. It, it wasn't hard for me to get them there. So I had ideas initially, we discussed some ideas for how the characters would kind of mirror each other. Uh, they had their own thoughts that they brought to me. And then they also checked in with each other occasionally, I understand behind the scenes, just to make sure they were both on the same page about how Voss would behave in a certain situation. And then in a scene, scene by scene way, we just sort of felt it out and developed it collaboratively on set. It, it's a seemingly complicated problem that in practice was easy just because I was working with such good performers. When I watched Possessor, some films came into my mind, for instance, it reminded me, let's say, of Mulholland Drive and also of Persona, Bergman's Persona, because the fact that when the characters melt, let's say, with each other, right? Of course, in very different situations, it doesn't have any of the sci-fi aspect to it, these two films that I quoted, but did you have any films that inspired you in doing that film, or do you ever watch films, and how much the film history gets into your mind when you're creating your own films? It's hard to say. Of course, seeing both those films, I really like Persona a lot, especially. But I usually don't come up with an idea for a film based on other films. It usually comes from something else, and, and I developed it 
in writing from something else. I usually, I usually try and read novels that sort of relate to what I'm writing to avoid sort of drawing from films too much because I feel like that there's a danger if you turn to films too much while you're making films that, that you start to kind of recycle other people's material. I do watch a lot of movies, especially leading up to shooting uh, with, say, Kareem, again, or Rob Cotterill, you know, we'll all sit down and watch a lot of stuff together. But it isn't really the case that I, I can point to one or two films and just say that this was, you know, a, a touchstone or that, you know, this was a major inspiration. It's more like a, a mass of material that I just kind of like pack into a, a loaf in the back of my brain somewhere. And I just sort of gnaw on it like a rat as I'm, as I'm working, you know. There are films that we watch, but I can't really point to a handful of them and say that this is where Possessor came from, you know. What I'm trying to say is, I don't think you get something like specifically from a film, right? But rather, it's engraved in our minds. Like when you're a filmmaker and a film viewer or consumer, let's say. I don't like the consumer word, but... Yeah, no, I, and I'm sure. But I, I, guess, I guess what I'm saying is that there are people who are very conscious of that and they can say, here are my influences for this particular film. And I'm always terrible with that question. I don't know. Like, I'm absorbing things, but in this really haphazard way. Uh, you know, occasionally there'll be something like, you know, like... Argento's opera, for instance, we looked at specifically for certain kinds of stylized stabbings for some of the violence because it was meant to be this kind of dreamy stylized thing. For technical reasons, we looked at some of those giallos that kind of related to, or gialli that related, <laughs> that related to, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, to what we were doing. Do you feel comfortable being called a horror director? Are you bothered with that or are you comfortable no. with it? I mean, I mean, most of my feature films certainly have been horror films, and I'm perfectly comfortable being called a horror filmmaker. I'm not specifically trying to be a horror filmmaker. You know, I like the genre. There are some people who set out specifically to be called horror filmmakers because that's the kind of filmmaking they really love. I really like horror films. I'm happy to be called a horror filmmaker, but I'm not. It's just sort of where my, head, my, my head's at right now, so it's not that I'm specifically looking to do that kind of filmmaking, although all of my upcoming films are also horror films, so maybe, I don't know. I'm asking this to everybody. You do horror films that scary people. What are you scared of, personally? That's another hard one. I don't have any great fears <laughs> to kind of let you in on. I don't know. I don't know how to end. I'm just scared of the usual stuff, you know, that, that everyone's scared of. I don't have any, like, special phobias that make for a good answer. Okay, but which are the common fears, then? The common fears, you know, a, a long and painful death, <laughs> <laughs> or, or you know, a great deal of pain in general. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to have long, painful experiences in general. I know that one of the hardest thing in the Possessor film was the last sequence, which was very graphic and spoiler alert has to do with a child being killed. Did that make it more difficult for you to get financing for the film at one point or not at all? I mean, probably. <laughs> we, had, we, had a lot of, we had a lot of trouble getting the film financed, but I mean, it changed. I wrote, I think, 33 different versions of the, the script over eight years, and it changed a lot. That wasn't always the ending. There were many different endings, and you know, I reworked it many different times. I think the problem is it's hard to get independent films made regardless of whether you're shooting the kid at the end. That doesn't help, but it, it's just a really difficult process. Casting is really difficult. Financing is always tied to casting. It's hard to get films made, especially when you're starting out. So I'm sure I wasn't helping things, given the, the nature of the film. But at the same time, you know, people like genre films. I mean, there, there's a, to a certain extent, because there's a kind of built-in audience, you know, that helps even if you're, you're making a graphic film. You're, you're talking to people who just want to know how to sell the film, right? And, and that's how you're getting your money. And so I think working in genre should theoretically help, but it took eight years to get it made. So, uh, you know, I think it's just mostly the usual independent film problems. Well, if it serves at all as a compensation, I don't know. It's uh, in Brazil now, we have a really hard time. All the independent, independent filmmakers are having a really hard time in financing their films because we, you know, the, we have a government that kind of, I mean, I'm, I shouldn't go into that since we're doing this for the museum, but we have a government that doesn't like culture at all. So it's very complicated. So. That, that sounds horrible. That, that doesn't make me feel better at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I would love you guys to have an easy time making films. That's terrible. 
Yeah, no, but I mean, I know Canada has a, tra a big tradition in, in producing films. That's what I mean. Like, so it's, it's bad to know that you are having this problem over there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, we, we have good support, but you still have to get, for films beyond a certain size, you still have to get outside funding. And still, you can't fund it only with Canadian money, so it sort of makes the production more attractive in some ways, but unless you have someone who wants to come in and cover your financing gap, it's still apparently a problem. I don't know. <laughs> it took a long time. You mentioned that genre films now, I think it has a lot of followers. So, I mean, it's films that usually they have big box office results. So why do you think people like to be scared so much? What is your theory about that? God, I don't know. Maybe it's just the, the sort of adrenaline, the adrenaline rush of it, you know? I mean, maybe it's the, something as basic and visceral. It's funny because I think when you're talking about mainstream horror and what's scary, these days you tend to be talking about jump scares. You know, when you, a lot of the companies that are making the most successful horror films like Blumhouse or, you know, The Conjuring Universe or whatever, they're all based around this, something jumping out at you and startling you. And that's what's considered scary. And that's what sells. And there's a kind of science behind it. You know, you have to have a jump scare here, 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 here. <laughs> that's going to sell. The audience will be terrified. And they talk about fear in those terms. And it obviously works. You know, obviously audiences like that uh, you know I, maybe it's you know the equivalent of going on a roller coaster ride or you know a haunted house at a fair or whatever something about the collective experience of being startled to me that's not scary i i don't really love jump scares because i feel like you know it's fi it's fine if you do i don't have i don't have anything against those films but to me it's really easy you know it's just you, it's just the made you look of filmmaking that isn't to me essential to horror and to me that isn't really scary i mean it's it's anxiety producing because there's going to be a loud noise at some point soon and it's going to make you jump but i'm more interested in i guess films that explore kind of dread and certain ideas and emotions that are not necessarily slow burn films, but I mean, there's, there's so much more to horror and to the, the emotional spectrum that that kind of genre of filmmaking engages with. But those films tend to not be as commercial. You know, those aren't the, the mainstream horror films. So I don't know that audiences in large numbers are flocking to films that are exploring, you know, existential dread in, in this kind of slow and, <laughs> and misanthropic way, but they do at least like to be startled and the fact that the, all those films are, are kind of connected in the same genre in the minds of people who finance films can be useful because it means you can do some, some sort of you know artful stuff in the context of genre which has always been there there's, there's such a history of exploitation cinema for instance where it's like there's, there's some really smart stuff that you can get away with if you have enough sex and violence or, or whatever it takes to to sell tickets It's interesting because now listening to you, I'm thinking like these are almost like two di completely different genres, right? The jump scare and the more Cronenbergian horror films. And by that, uh, of course, I know Cronenbergian has become a synonym of this subgenre, let's say, of body horror, normally filled with body fluid and exploding heads and bits of tech gory. Do you think that adjective could be used to describe your films and are you comfortable with it? I don't know. I mean, it's my general answer to that sort of stuff is I just, I'm not the person to ask, you know, I, I'm the, exactly the wrong person to ask. I don't have that kind of perspective. I'm too close to my father and, and his films to see them with any kind of objectivity. And I'm of course too close to my own films to see them with any kind of objectivity. I think, yeah, I see some parallels, obviously to some of his earlier work, but he's also had a, such a long and varied career, you know, to me, it's sort of, I'm too in the thick of it. And, it, and it's not really sort of interesting to me when I'm making films, if it's a path of analysis, that's interesting for other people, if they find that to be, you know, kind of fruitful or engaging in any way, then more power to them. I'm not offended, but it's not something I feel like I can speak about with any kind of real perspective. I suppose it, it should be a delicate thing because, of course, you're so close to it. But just as a curiosity, I mean, you mentioned his early films, your father's. I read that you, when you were a child, you were present in some of the sets. Do you have any recollections of that? I mean, did, do you think that somehow, I know it's strange to say that influenced you because you were a child probably, but somehow that engraved in your brain? Well, I, I should say, first of all, when you go to a film set, it's in practice very boring. I mean, anyone who's been to a film set knows it's, it's mostly just sitting around and you're looking at flats and nothing's happening. And so as a child, it's not that I was going to film sets and having some sort of magical experience that was then, you know, fueling my love 
for film or it was it was kind of mundane and I, I didn't know that it was unusual in any way. I think what it probably did was give me some perspective on what filmmaking is in, in a kind of day-to-day -day way, definitely going into film school and knowing that filmmaking had this sort of pragmatism involved in it and that a film set was a mundane thing. I think I had some maybe useful perspective on it. It wasn't, I wasn't expecting it to be this, you know, the, this source of magic. Like I kind of understood that the nuts and bolts of it when I started getting into making my own films. So I'm sure that was useful, but more in that sense rather than in, in some sort of inspiring sense. I see. I'm also an independent filmmaker. I did a documentary, so but I can totally feel I work in films before, so I know what you mean. Some film sets are super boring, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but I was just wondering, maybe a film set from one of the early films of your father's, like with exploding heads and everything, could be more fun than, let's say, the ones I work with. I mean, maybe. I was never there for any <laughs> heads exploding, so, <laughs> you know. And also, you're a kid, so you're... You know, there, there are days when it's good to bring a kid to set and there are days when it's not good to bring a kid, a kid to set. So I'm, I'm sure that was partly dictating what I was exposed to. Oh, I see. So you lost the, the fun days, let's say. I guess, yeah. I, guess, I don't remember. I don't remember the fun days. But. <laughs> Brandon, what are you working now? What are going to be your next projects um, so, uh, um, that the, you can talk about? Yeah, I mean, there's a film that I'm meant to be shooting this year in the fall called Infinity Pool. I can't say too much about it just yet, but I can say that, that I'm shooting. That's going to be my next film. It's sort of a tourist resort satire with some sci-fi horror elements to it. So that will be, barring any unforeseen disasters, the, the next thing that I do. Oh, I see. I'm happy to hear. That's already said. You're going to film it this year. Um, um, yeah, I'm yeah. Afraid. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I like to engage in a certain amount of defensive pessimism with this because my last film fell apart so many times. But it it now seems to be very much a real thing, and so yeah, I'm excited to, to finally get. One of the people that I interviewed for the series was the director Peter Strickland. Now, if it makes you happier, let's say he was also complaining about the difficulties of making the film. He's trying to do, making his new film for a long time, and it fell off also many times. So I guess it's not something related to Canada or Brazil. He's in UK, so I guess it's everywhere in the world. Basically, yeah. so. again, it doesn't make me happy at all. I feel I feel terrible for it. And also, he uh, his producer on that was one of my producers on Possessor also. So I feel for Andy Stark and all of his <laughs> you know, tricky uh, film productions. Who is the producer? Andy Stark, Andrew Stark. Um, oh, okay. So he's the same from In Fabric and from Possessor. I didn't know that. Yeah, he did a bunch of Ben Wheatley's films and he's sort of an old friend of my cinematographer. So I knew him. Great. Ben Wheatley is also on our list. So oh, okay. That, so <laughs> you can ask you him have... about Andy. Okay, great. I think we have his contact, but I'll contact Sophia about his contact because I would love to interview him as well. He's a very interesting director, just like you. Do you have any other projects that you are working on that you can talk or this is the one? I mean, that's, that's the main one. I'm trying to adapt Super Pan as a, as a mini series. I don't really have anything interesting to say about it because I'm still working on the writing. Also with Andy that I'm trying to turn into a mini series. So that's in very in the very early stages though. Okay, great. I guess that's it. I hope this was not so painful. Oh, it wasn't it wasn't painful <laughs> at all. It was lovely to speak with you. And uh, yeah, thanks thanks so much for having me on this. Okay. Well thank you very much and I hope to see Infinite Pool soon. I love the title. <laughs> uh, it's something very nowadays like everything is infinite pool right uh, in Brazil <laughs> in Brazil it's funny we have varanda gourmet it's also a kind of infinite pool which is like a gourmet varanda so it's not a kitchen <laughs> but it's a gourmet varanda so I love these uh, expressions don't mean much but <laughs> that's super trendy gourmet veranda is the next one for sure <laughs> well, it's an idea for a next one <laughs> okay well thank you very much thanks so much uh, Okay, and as soon as we have the link, we'll send it to you. Okay, cool. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. Take care. Okay, thank you. You too. Bye-bye.